So the topic of my presentation is Vriksha Ayurveda, Traditional Indian Plant Science, Retrospect and Prospect. So the outline is I'm going to tell you something about, uh, introduce and talk something about the source material because it's not very widely known what Vriksha Ayurveda is. Something about testing, validation and use of these practices. Certain unique Vriksha Ayurveda approaches and then think together of a roadmap for 2047. Ayurveda, as we all know, is a science of life and Mriga Ayurveda is Ayurveda for animals. Similarly, there is this entire uh, corpus of knowledge and wisdom called Vriksha Ayurveda, which is Ayurveda for plants and trees. And like in Ayurveda itself, we have a Shastri Parampara, which is classical literature, and Lok Parampara, which is folk literature. So the classical literature is in the form of texts, which are manuscripts or published books. They have clearly spelt out theoretical framework based on Panchamabhut Siddhant, Tridosh Vichar. And these are, there are Puranas and Samhitas like even Agni Purana which have a chapter on Viksha Ayurveda. There are general texts like even <coughs> Chanakya's Arthashastra which has sections on Viksha Ayurveda. And then there are texts that are completely and specifically devoted to Viksha Ayurveda. For example, Viksha Ayurveda of Surapala. Kashipya, Krishi, Sukti, these are all examples. And then in local languages, there are texts like Lokopakara in Kannada or Krishi Gita in Malayalam. The scope of Riksha Ayurveda, what does it talk about? No, it's very comprehensive. It talks about collection, selection and storage of seeds, germination and sowing, various techniques for plant propagation, grafting, nursing and irrigation, testing and classification of soil, Selection of soils suitable for various types of plants, manuring, pest, disease management, nomenclature, taxonomy, description and classification of plants to suit varied purposes, favorable and unfavorable meteorological conditions, what are the titi varas and nakshatras in which you do various operations, use of plants as indicators for weather, water, minerals, and also chapters on botanical marvels. So, Vrikshari's approach is it talks about plants and health, how to promote good health in plants, plants and disease. Plants also have prakriti like the case of human beings, you would be interested, no, not very surprised. Treatment for pests, diseases and injuries, similar to Ayurvedic approach. For example, we are told that plants can also have vata, pitta or kapha prakriti. Typically, this is a tree with kapha constitution which has stout and thick stems. Plenty of leaves and branches, abundant fruits and flowers. Those who are used to thinking of Prakriti in the human context can easily relate to that. Or similarly, here is a plant that is affected by Pitta. Like you have the Kamala affected person. Yellow or discolored leaves, oozing occurring in fruits, aging prematurely, variety of things like this. Similarly, we also have lines of treatment like using cow's milk, which is having certain properties like Sita and Madhura and all that you can treat such diseases. Similarly, there is a whole folk literature or a Lok Parampara. There are popular magazines, newsletters, publications in technical and peer-reviewed journals. Several compilations also interestingly, something by ICR. I want to make a particular mention because sometimes there is a feeling all sorts of things are done, all sorts of things are claimed and said, but are they tested, who has looked at it, who has validated it. Interestingly, here is a case where the Indian Council of Agriculture Research did a survey and documentation on traditional knowledge or documented practices relating to agriculture during these three years. They produced a total of seven volumes, including a volume on testing and validation of these practices. A total of nearly 5,000 practices were documented. Volumes like this were published, which I have seen and we have access to. They talk about variety of topics like tillage and intercultural management, cropping system, pest and disease management. What's most interesting is that we have done a meta-analysis of the validation of these results. We find that as many as 85% are proved valid, 2.7% are partly valid and so on. So this is not just a stupendous body of knowledge, but it's tremendous that a corpus of knowledge like this stands the test of validation so rigorously. You know, this is very important for us to know because we think it's a jumble of all sorts of things that all sorts of people have said thousand years back, hundred years back, we don't know what it is. 
I want to give you a few illustrations about practical use of the Brickshire with the about for pest control, seed treatment, package of practices for various crops, storage forms, and underline that Brickshire is also talks about common approach underlying plant, animal, and human health. You know, this is the aerial view of Theosophical Society in Chennai. It's like in the area River Estuary, it's 300 plus acres. 25 years back, the garden superintendent of this campus. Arjun Rajgopal, who was Arjun Gopal Ratham, was my high school classmate and he was an army officer. He called me and said, Look, you talk all sorts of things about natural products, Brickshire with a. I have a problem with mango leaf fiber is badly infesting my mango growth. Can you do something about it? And we don't believe, we don't want to use any harsh chemicals. So, myself and my colleague, Vaiti Sham Sundar, was working with me on Brickshire with a. We looked at these, what are the symptoms, and based on Brickshire, the approach came up with the treatment, which is a mixture of neem oil and pungam oil spray and fumigation with Daru Haridra and Vai Vudanga. It was very interesting for us to see that there was a reversal of these symptoms, plant growth was enhanced, and then they put forth new leaves, I mean, new flowers and new fruits, you know. Lots of experiences like this. In the area of seed treatment, Brickshire that talks about Fumigation with specific herbs, soaking in milk, soaking in things like cow's urine, panchagavya at various concentrations. This in Sirgai in our field location, we had designed a piece of equipment like this, where there is a blower, there is a heating element and a fumigator, where we can store seeds. We have tested in collaborative experiments with the agricultural college in <coughs> Chidambaram, you know, that's Sirgari, near Sirgari, methods to look at seed bone diseases like fusarium built, how by this kind of fumigation with things like vacha and vaivudanga, we can provide protection against these. We have also brought out a lot of publications where we put together practices tested validated from Brikshayaruda as well as farmers wisdom like organic cotton cultivation, neem, organic paddy cultivation. We have also picked up in it Lots of practices from Lok Parampara. For example, this is a Lok Parampara in Tamil Nadu. That a bag consisting of Vepambunak, neem seed cake, is put in the head of the irrigation channel as the water flows in. So, this has a terrific effect. It offers not just protection against pests, but it also is a kind of a fertilizer. No? It fertilizes the field. Searching for new biopesticides is very interesting because the Acharyas have told us that there are herbs with this classification that they have belong to the krimigna grana, you know, that which can be used to control krimi. Of course, one has to use one dupaya and yukti and see which particular herb is used for which particular disease of the crop. But we have taken clues from texts, clues from farmers and we have screened them for crops, pest storage forms. For example, just to give one particular instance, Andrographis paniculata or Kirata Tikta, which is used in folk medicine, not widely used by farmers, which is extremely bitter. We find that it is very effective in controlling fruit and shoot borers in some crops. Storage forms of biopesticide, there is one other application which we have tested. Today, farmers say that, look, I have in the from the chemical factory a bottle that I can just dilute and spray. Don't tell me take 2 kilos of this, half kilos of this, boil, filter, dilute, add and all that. Can you give me an easier recipe? Now Ayurveda has products for immediate use which is like Swarasa or Kashaya. Kashaya is just kept overnight, that's all your kada. Whereas there are storage forms like Arka which is a distillate, Thaila which is an oil, Aswa and Arishta which are fermented products. So what we have done is we have taken some materials which have biopesticidal properties like Ada Dora, Arka and even things like uh, garlic. We have converted them into storage forms and we have found them quite effective. These are some programs which are taken up, supported even by the Department of Science and Technology to develop storage forms of biopesticides. Advantage of this Ayurvedic approach is non-polluting. There is no requirement of toxic or corrosive solvents or chemicals. No requirement of high temperature or pressure. Process is low cost. Technology for preparation of something like Kashayam, Thailam, Arishtam, 
is very widely known to our people and the Vaidya community. No? A very interesting insight is the common approach underlying plant, human and animal health that comes across. No? For example, there is a problem that is faced with this Kushmanda. There is a whole lot of flowering. Sometimes the flowers wither. There is no proportionate fluting. It just drops. And there is a farmer's wisdom for it saying that you take a piece of asafoetida or hing. You bury it near the root and irrigate it. We tested it and found. But what we find is that the Ayurvedic wisdom behind it is this transformation is really governed by the regulation of vata and hing helps in correction. That's the regulation of vata. What is very interesting is that in many of these things, when you look at the ganas, they have properties cutting across life form. Something like garbhasthapaka or garbhaposhaka gana dravyas, which works for the human female, is also used in ethno-veterinary medicine. It's also useful that we find for plants. You know, This is something which is quite mind-blowing to somebody like me whose basic training is modern biochemistry. So, the last two, three minutes I want to spend some time answering this question. What is the roadmap to 2047? What are the weaknesses of this parampara and what are the strengths? What are the efforts that are required and what are the returns possible? The folk tradition is weakened. There is no classic sastric tradition that is strong. People tell us, look, we are not having high quality Ayurvedic inputs even to treat patients. You are asking about plants and trees, you know. Please try elsewhere, you know. Not so rude, but almost. People are fascinated, but are they willing to invest years together in research? Translation of textual prescription and practice poses gaps and problems. Large number of texts of Brikshayadada are not readily available. High quality Ayurveda input involvement is difficult. On the other hand, Existence of parampara, however weak, is a great blessing. I cannot sufficiently underline this point. If we just have the text, we could be doing years of research before we zero down on what concentration and all that. Applications and solutions are possibly great commercial value. Experiments are easy to design and perform in comparison with human or animal subjects. You know, If you want to do an experiment for which you need 100 Garbinis to check, uh, you know, Pandu, you know the ethics committee and the complications and the challenges. You want Prakshara the patient, they can give it to you acres and acres of it. You know? Existence of folk and classical tradition, unique strength of Asia, particularly India. What are the efforts that we need to make? You know, First thing is publication of manuscripts and Prakshara the documentation of folk practices and widespread dissemination. Pilot projects on testing and validation followed by comprehensive programs on promising leads. Creating a human resource base, introducing Brikshayaratha as a subject in agriculture and BMS courses and as a specialization at the postgraduate level. What are the returns possible? I would like to spell out these. Medicinal plants cultivation. The era of continuous harvesting of medicinal plants from the wild is drawing to an end. Ayurveda and traditional medicine, the lady who spoke about cancer said that we need plants that are cultivated in an organic way to treat. No? You have pro people laden with chemistry problems. You don't want to treat them with plants that are cultivated with chemicals. We cannot and should not cultivate medicinal plants with chemical packages of this kind. Rikshayaratha offers a powerful knowledge base for developing organic packages. Both at the national and global level, the increase of food production is not keeping a pace with the increasing global population and the purely chemical approach has reached its limits. India can emerge very strongly as a global leader building on indigenous knowledge and this can really offer you a new paradigm for agriculture based on Panchamabhut Siddhant and Tridosh Vichar. I just send with one last slide, Professor Maheshwari who addressed the Indian Science Congress made this powerful statement. In fact, even in the modern world, plant power means as much or more than water power, sea power, atomic energy. For obtaining plants, men have gone forth to the sword to distant lands, set upon long voyages and conquered new lands, you know. And this is the last Subhashita sloga that I leave you with. Amantra maksharam nasti nasti mula manavshadam. Our ancestors have said, just as there is not a single letter which doesn't have the potential to be the mantra, there is not a single plant which doesn't have the potential medicinal value. So I will just... Thank you very much for your patient hearing. I congratulate Darshan and his team for putting together such a galaxy of authorities and Maharatis of ISM from all over India and it's a great opportunity.